Alrighty, recording. Okay. Today we begin two sessions of uh, John Locke's uh, Second Treaties of Civil Government, which requires that we say something about the First Treaties, um, even though the Second Treaties is the one that is um, uh, sort of like a, a huge um, treaties that that in many ways lays the foundation for um, future constitutions, including ours the uh, U.S. Constitution. Um, so just uh, just some quick quick things, uh, just to sort of place him. Um, his, his dates run uh, 1632 to 1704. So we're getting closer and closer to our time. Um, I knew John, well, I didn't know him, but I was familiar with John Locke from a different vantage point uh, early on. Um, because he uh, because he's also an important figure in the area of epistemology or theory of knowledge and uh, would actually sort of cover him in uh, my survey courses in philosophy but the epistemology not the political philosophy so much um, so it's uh, it, it's interesting to note that he is as we saw with Aristotle um, a, an empiricist um, so, you know, basically when you click, click, make a claim to know, you ultimately claim to know through your senses. He's also the one that gave us the uh, um, terminology of the uh, tabula rasa, which is a blank slate. So he sees the mind as being a blank slate that is just basically very passively waiting to receive sense data um, <laughs> through, the, um, through, through the organs, uh, sense organs. And um, this is... We, we just we haven't talked about this, but um, but this is in counter to uh, Descartes' idea. Descartes was a rationalist like Plato, um, and both of them held to some form of innate ideas. And Locke, um, with his sort of um, his his form of empiricism, counters that that there actually are no innate ideas inside the mind, but the mind is a blank slate. And then as soon as you start to sense your world around you, that's when you start to get anything into your mind. Um, so he is an empiricist. It'll be interesting in our discussion to see how that plays into his political philosophy. Um, even though he sees the mind that way, it does seem that he has a lot to say about human nature. Um, so there is something about us that is constituted, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at least when it comes to knowing, um, seemingly there isn't other than how our senses take in information and place them onto our minds um three really important works uh essay concerning human understanding that was the uh work on epistemology uh that i, that I just referenced this theory uh two treaties of civil government which the first the, the first uh treaties given my research i'm not sure if you did any is against uh monarchical absolutism so he sets up an interesting um counter to everything that we've been reading about hobbes and then uh too bad we're not including it in our reading even though it's in our book is the letter concerning toleration which is basically about um how religious truth should never be uh imposed by force um which is clearly something that is part of our um constitution mm -hmm declaration and constitution um so whatever maybe down the road we can actually get into that so the the, the first treaties uh much longer than the second um and it's basically a breakdown of the uh, theory of the divine right of kings which he does reference in the second treaties that we're discussing uh apparently this was faddish during his time and uh, the the author he references early on in our reading today, which by the way we're covering chapters one through ten, is uh, by by uh, a man by the name of Robert Filmer, who was advocating and arguing for the uh, divine right of kings. So he uh, so that apparently that one is goes deeply into that topic, whereas the second treaties which is what we're about shifts away from that sort of like all right i've checked my boxes i've done my argument now what is my positive instead of negative uh, argument for uh, civil society 
Mm -hmm. So that's what we get here, which sort of leads us into the introduction. Chapter one. Yes. Uh, because I think he lays out in section three what he wants to do, how he wants to develop this. He says, political power then I take to be a right of making laws with penalties of death and consequently all less penalties for the regulating and preserving of property. Huge topic for Locke and of employing the force of the community in the execution of such laws and in the defense of the commonwealth from foreign injury and all this only for the public good. So he, there we get sort of a, a bit of whatever, maybe, maybe sort of like a thumbnail sketch of what we're going to see developed mm -hmm. in the rest of the book. That's my introduction. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Um, let's, let's, did you have anything in one? Um, I it's mean, short. kind of just the beginning sections felt like I was getting Hobbes vibes with the first yeah. few chapters because there are a lot of definitions and totally. repeated themes and um, topics yeah. like, you know, nature, laws, contracts, sure. those kinds of things. I do think that there is when, when we talk about Locke, we are going to have to Hobbes is going to be an interesting foil mm -hmm. because he is not consistently Hobbesian. And yet there are times when he is. Right. And so there is a bit of a break, but there, uh, yeah, there's some similarities as well. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap, especially in like, uh, I guess, the, the more underlying term, uh, tones and um, assumptions. Totally. I think especially with the um, with notions of you know, you know, escaping the state of nature, but their notion of the state of nature is not identical. Right. But escaping the state of nature uh, is, is, is very similar um, and the and the need for it. And then there are these and then also just sort of like vaguely the use of the terminology of natural law. But I don't think they they see totally eye to eye on that. Mm -hmm. And then having to invest your your freedom in a power but but that power is going to be differently defined but the investing in it the representative um is going to be in in that there's a similarity yeah um so state of nature chapter two um we have a uh I mean, basically this is like a condition of perfect freedom mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that there's no civil authority and no civil obligations. Um, and that sounds like Hobbes, but the difference is that the, for Locke, the state of nature is actually a moral condition. And if we go back to Hobbes, it was an amoral uh, condition. There were no, uh, there, there were no moral directives as it were. So, Keep in mind, this is not a man-made law, right? Because that's that's non-existent, because uh, there is no government in a, in this state of nature. But for Hobbes, it was pretty much just sort of like this wild um, sort of situation uh, where anyone could do anything to you, and you're living in a state of fear, all that. But and and morality doesn't start till the contract is made. But for Hobbes. The, this state of nature is has a moral component to it. It's governed by a moral law, right? Um, and that is an interesting distinction. Um, I mean, that moral law is basically it, it's sort of like I mean, this is sort of the weird thing as I think about it because the uh, I mean, even though Hobbes says there are no morals prior to the contract. I mean, he does remember he, he 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 enumerated like a whole list of natural laws, right? You know? Um, but so that it, it, I I think in that part I might be a, a little unsure, you know. But we are sure that that Hobbes says there's no there are no ethics, there's no morality until there's a um, until there's a social contract. 
you know. Mm-hmm. See, I think what I think what the the nat, it's almost sort of like the natural law in Hobbes is a prompting to get you to make the contract in addition to the state of nature, which is a condition of war. Right. right? Yeah. So, it, but it seems more of a prompting, like man, I you know, I, uh, in order to get out of this situation and in order to preserve my life, I need to form this contract i form the contract and voila all of these laws come in place that sort of reinforce the natural laws whereas with Locke, it seems to be no there actually are moral laws governing the state of nature um that are true laws it it might be well moral laws but it might be difficult to sort of defend them because you are in a state of nature Are are you with me yeah trying to see if there's a huge difference between those Mm -hmm. um like the state of perfect freedom versus like uh Hobbes is I guess chaos yeah those are pretty much equivalent but then there's uh with Locke there's the state of equality and it almost sounds like that like what what is packed into that is the same as Hobbes's natural laws Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so I don't know if there's a huge difference if you just like match it up that way. Yeah, the, I mean the 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 difference though is that um, I'm trying to go through my Hobbes notes now. Um, hmm. Um, yeah, which, which are a little sketchy in the first part of the, the first part of the book. Um, yeah, I mean, it's the, the I mean, it, it, it's it, so there is a moral law, but the more for Hobbes, but the moral law it was basically self preservation, right? Yeah. Um, and then he had all these other moral laws, and um, the, and it seemed like those other moral laws were, um, you know, sort of stemming from, remember, he was like very deductive, yeah. That, that first law the problem is that i'm getting is i just don't know how they're binding you know because because you can do whatever you want to do and Mm -hmm. for Locke, it seems like in the state of nature you 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 can't do whatever you want to do because there you are morally morally not legally or civilly morally bound by natural law in other words natural law is sort of like that's why i was sort of saying like my guess with hobbes is sort of like a prompting like it's sort of something that's pushing you like, oh, man, I want to preserve myself. Um, because it, because if, if you say that there, there are no ethics in a state of nature, then well, then there's, you know, there's nothing binding you. you know? mm-hmm. um, and so in that sense, it sort of it sort of seems like there's a difference. But the fact that he that, 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 that Hobbes, you know, talks so much about natural law um makes it seem like there is some reality to it in a state of nature. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That that one's sort of a tricky one. I mean, we know, yeah, we know we'll see other differences because he certainly, Locke certainly doesn't believe in, you know, an absolute monarch. Um, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's peace and sociability, there's equality for Locke, uh, no one should harm another person in their life, liberty, or possessions, um, which to me does not sound like a war of all against all, you know? Right. Yeah, it's interesting um, because in Locke, um, I guess. He's not, like, I guess he's coming with the assumption that moral laws, you know, are there. Yeah. And um, he even says that the power and jurisdiction are reciprocal. So Mm -hmm. it's like 
it's something that's um, interconnected between people. Yeah, exactly. Um, whereas with Hobbes, he doesn't consider that to be, I guess he doesn't really consider that to be something that exists um, in the first place. Like it has to be deduced. Yeah. Right. Like you said, for, for self-preservation. Right. Um, so it's weird. Like, I almost want to say that like, like for Hobbes, natural law is like an impulse. You know, like I'm thinking about the, the, the impulse or the desire. Well, it sounds like itself. a self-defense. Yeah, exactly. I don't know about impulse. Well, maybe I'm not thinking about the right word, but it's like, but it doesn't sound to me like a, a law that's binding. It sounds like a moral law that's binding uh, or sort of like controlling your um, behavior. It sounds more like, um, you know, whatever, here I am <laughs> in the wild and outside of civilization and i'm you know trying to save myself and my family um and there's no protection and i'm living in fear like mm -hmm. however you take that it's like a condition you know and it's like out of that condition you're like <clears throat> i want to save myself i want to protect myself yeah you it's know, almost sort, like sort of, like yeah. the assumption of hobbes is that we don't have like we have to take control over our environment in the world like yeah. otherwise it's chaos but the yeah. assumption of Locke is more like we do have control over the environment and the world and we need to take responsibility over that yes yes and, yeah, exactly you know like the, the, this I, I feel like Locke's notion of natural law is a little bit more like Aquinas's where it's like it's it's written it's like written in the heart it's mm -hmm. it's part of your constitution and I whereas for for Hobbes I, I'm not sure where to put it you know um, but it does, it doesn't seem to be that, that notion that, um, you know, you know, whatever, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, the moral law doesn't prompt you seemingly for Hobbes to create society, getting out of the condition of continual war seems to be the reason you create society. Right. But for Locke, it's sort of like, Hey, you know, equality, self-preservation uh you know, this reciprocal nature that you were bringing about that's already there in in a state of nature the problem mm -hmm. is hey, the problem is executing it yeah and and um so in, in, in a sense you could say that the moral law that is made up in a state of nature is really still operative in civil society it's just it, it you're just able to do it better you're able to enact it more consistently yeah because you have more checks and balances when there's something that has, you know, that tries to break the equality. Yes. Whereas in Hobbes, it's like, if there's an imbalance, there's an imbalance. You need to have the mm -hmm. structure. You need to have the structure if you want to balance it. Yeah. It would warrant, I mean, not right now, but it would warrant maybe returning to some of those natural law sections of Hobbes mm -hmm. just to get some clarity on it. Um, so what I do think is interesting is um you know this this language comes up in uh the uh, some of our founding documents um specifically uh the laws of nature and nature's god and it makes me wonder to what degree and we can discuss this now but we'll probably discuss it with um the declaration of independence in the constitution to what degree this notion of natural law that we'll find in the founding documents has some theological resonance. Now, the reason I bring that up is that the, the the question then you can raise about the founding documents is to what degree they are absolutely secular uh, or <clears throat> have somewhat of a theological foundation, right? Because we've mm -hmm. got like the separation of church and state so on and so forth. But at the same point, the separation of church and state might be more along the lines of like religious toleration, right? In other words, it's not it's it's not saying that the foundation of these documents are secular. It could be the case that the foundation of the documents are theological. However, there's insight enough to realize that we shouldn't force the will of an individual to believe in a particular religion. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, 
you know, the, the, the language of Locke and his notion of natural law, and he doesn't really give us fully a foundation of it, like where it comes from, right? I mean, there's a lot of God talk and biblical references, yeah. But 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 I feel like he doesn't absolutely nail down like and it comes from God, you know, something like that. Um, so it'll be interesting to kick around um, when we get to um, yeah the our founding documents. Mm-hmm. So state of war, what what did, what did you get on that, or whatever's getting your fancy? Um, well, before that, I was going to say. Oh yeah, sure. Um, one like one of the the laws of nature had to do with punishing the crime, like crimes. Sure. And you know that power is given to is basically given to anyone who. Yes. You know, can exactly each individual. That, yeah, each individual has that power. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, and it specifically uses the language, which I think is interesting, uh, of executive power. They have yes. that executive power. Executive right. law. Yeah. Uh, they get like uh, I'm trying to find where it was, but they gave an example. Uh, they gave an example. He gave an example where, like, you have the a man has the right to to put to death another man who was murdered mm-hmm. um, because like because it you know that wasn't a that wasn't moral that wasn't a moral thing to do it mm-hmm. was not fair um, uh, p- page eight top of oh yeah every man in a state of nature has a power to kill a murderer both to deter others from doing uh, the like injury with no yeah. reparation and compensate yes which is interesting because it's like um in the in the the natural environment assuming like um everyone has the like it's a responsibility everyone has the responsibility Mm -hmm. and um some people are not going to be responsible so the others will have to balance that out yeah yeah and i think what's what's um interesting too is at the bottom of eight section 13 that in a state of nature everyone has the executive power of the law of nature and this becomes a problem right because it's not as if i as an individual uh as executive uh in a in a particular case or situation am not am, am going to be impartial mm-hmm right yep. and uh so I'm, I'm going to be thinking for myself i'm going to be thinking for my own and my own property and my own family and my own friends my own community and and therefore you know you know uh execute the action accordingly which is a problem because if everyone then is their own executive right right you're going to have sort of like a uh a form of chaos Um, Because everyone's sort of looking out for their own best interests, seemingly. Yes. And I think uh, following that, it says, um, I usually grant that civil government is the proper remedy for the inconveniences of the state Mm -hmm. of nature. There you go. Yeah, totally. And like we said before, sort of a continue, you know, it's sort of like we'll actually be able to really enforce the uh, those natural laws. Yeah. You know, and also to uh, freedom and security, right? Because he includes property. Property is a very broad category for him, which includes one's own person, right? Mm-hmm. Which which makes me think of self-preservation, which makes me think of natural law. Yes. You know. Um, Yeah. Uh, State of War? Uh, I'm trying to remember. I don't don't remember having a strong connection with this one. Um, I think this this sort of continues the idea of um, sort of a condition of war where the individual, and this becomes a problem, is judge, jury, executioner of the natural law, which is sort of reiterated with what we just said mm-hmm. or a little bit of, of you know 
um, yeah, of, of what we were saying about this being a problem. Um, um, yeah, that was sort of sort of in some what I what I what I got from that okay. section. But the big one, well, I'm sorry. There's there's slavery as well. The what I got sort of there um, was actually, even though he talks about slavery, were sort of sort of side comments where he in uh, 23 and 24 um, starts to at least indirectly or directly attack um, the Hobbesian notion of absolute power. Mm -hmm. I think it's at 24 where he actually uses. And this is something that's clearly part of, um, uh, you know, the United States Constitution, the notion of limited power, right? And this is not something that we saw with Hobbes, given our discussions, right? The sovereign right. has absolute power, the sovereign is not under the law. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, it's 23, it's the start of this freedom from absolute arbitrary power is so necessary and closely joined with the man's preservation that he cannot part with it, but by what forfeits his preservation and life together. So the, the, the notion of absolute uh, power there, even though it's in the context of slavery, um, seems to sort of hint at that. And then again in 24, um, he says, and uh, sort of going in the middle, to make an agreement for a limited power on the one side and obedience on the other, the state of war and slavery ceases as long as the compact in endures. So this notion again is, um, uh, yeah, it has sort of the notion of a limited power. It's interesting though, to look at the beginning of that, which I should have started with. This is the perfect condition of slavery, which is nothing else but the state of war continued, mm -hmm. right? Uh, between lawful conqueror and a captive. I don't know, how do you take that? Slavery being the state of war continued. Uh, I'm trying to understand. Um... Well, wait, so the state of war, um, I mean, wait, uh, the state of war has to do with absolute power, right? State of, uh, state of war is basically where, you know, you have the fundamental law where you need to be preserved. There is no government. Um, the, uh, and, and that's where every individual is, is his or her own, uh, exec executive and, or yeah, executive and legislator. And that's a problem. Right. Interesting. Um, I guess the arbitrary, uh, the arbitrary will of another would actually be the notion of slavery, right? In other words, that's that that is someone uh, enslaving someone against their will and forcing them to right. submit to it, right? Without that contract. Is arbitrary. Yeah, exactly. That is arbitrary, etc. Right, which is um, in which, contrast to um, servanthood, which he talks about at another time. Right. Um, where there is a, an end to the contract, right? And exactly. an agreement to enter it. Right, it's like temporary. Or, or in the case like of children, there's not an agreement to mm -hmm. enter it, but there right. is an end to it. Yeah. And I guess, too, slavery could be a part of the state of war just because, I mean, two things come to mind. If it's an actual war, then there are cap, you know, prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And then if there, if it's sort of state of nature in a Hobbesian sense or, you know, a condition of war in a Hobbesian sense, then one could take someone else 
as captive. Like right. Both are sort of operative there, but as soon as you have sort of a contract or an agreement that comes into place, it dissolves both. Right. right? The war and the slavery. Okay, property. This is this is big. Yeah, this I really is, like this, this is, section. This is, uh, I mean, this 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 will probably take us to the end of the uh, the call. Mm -hmm. um, Trying to find the quote that I really liked. Um, yeah. Because I mean, it said it basically said taking little from the common world uh, when there's abundance is like taking nothing at all. Yeah. And I thought that yeah. was very interesting. Oh yeah, exactly. I think that's be is, isn't that the notion that. Uh, labor adds something yes. to the commons yep. and because it adds something to the commons you're increasing its intrinsic value yeah whereas the and, and whatever hundredfold whatever whereas as commons there is no increase yes it doesn't belong right. to anyone yeah but if you put work into it then it it yeah. gains value now that notion was really interesting the notion of putting i mean it, there, there's so many things that come to mind right and he references this as well uh, sort of like you, you, you've got God creating. Uh, he has he creates this whole world, this whole environment, this earth. Uh, he puts humans in it. He gives them the command to cultivate it. Mm -hmm. uh, in so cultivating it, um, the, you know, like like putting yourself into it, as it were, acquiring it. Um, you are, yeah, you're you're increasing its value. It it, be, it becomes it's almost sort of like it's an extension of you. Right, like you're earning it. Yeah, yeah. Or I think about like um, working around the house, right? And we've been doing a lot of gardening lately, um, and all that work that goes that goes into it, um, sort of by default, gives it um, a certain sort of meaning that uh, passing whatever passing by someone else's house and garden doesn't have, right? Because I've done nothing to it. You know. Um. I mean, yeah, but. I mean, maybe they have, but but my my value is not put into that, into that home. Right, but it, but right. someone's value is put into it, which sure. is different from the yeah. common area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which which gives it worth. So it's not like their garden has no worth because you didn't put work into it. That's that, no, no. It's very true. It's just exactly. No, no. I'm yeah. not saying it doesn't have a value. It just doesn't have a value for me. In or the same it way. might have a value for you because you're like, wow, that's a really pretty garden. True. Um, true. But, but then, you can't just take it because. You know, they put the work into it, but you could trade right. for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, because it has value, you can trade that value. So one interesting thing here is that, uh, you know, it's the the Locke is is um, claiming, sort of indirectly, or maybe directly, that we are property acquiring beings, mm -hmm. and this is just sort of interesting to contrast it to. Um, like a like an Aristotle, which is sort of like we're the political animals. Like like what what one thing that constitutes us is politics. Is you know grouping together and ultimately doing politics and creating a regime that is you know a moderate regime that enables us to flourish as individuals. That that's a, a sort of a different trajectory, right? Um, I mean, I'm not saying that you couldn't incorporate the two. But at least when it comes to um, sort of where he's developing at least this argument, which seems pretty fundamental, like early on, mm -hmm. uh, is you know we're acquisitive. We are we are we are when it comes to um, uh, things, we want to acquire them. We want to make them our own. Right. And it's just sort of an interesting contra to uh, Aristotle. Uh, one other, other interesting thing, too, is that Plato, um, in his regime, we may have discussed this, but uh, we, if we didn't, we, we certainly should have. But he is much more of, uh, of has a communal um, basis mm -hmm. for his um, ideal, ideal city. That is to say that there's really not that much importance in the acquisition of money. There's really not that much that, you know, whatever, too much private property. I'm sure there was some private property. One has to have a house. Yeah. Um, is just not the focus, you know. I mean, this, it's not what's efficient for <laughs> his society. 
Yeah, exa- exactly. Because it's not, you know, whatever. If you have too much money, or you have the better house, so on and so forth. You start to pull, you start to pull apart at the at the structure, and he does, and, and and the whole matters more than the parts. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's an interesting uh, contrast as well. I think Machiavelli would probably fit beautifully in here <laughs> with the notion of property. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. you know. Well, maybe. Um, Maybe uh, there would be some contention with uh, the greed aspect because I think sure. you know Locke tries to combat the greed aspect with with the fact that you have to put work into the property. You, yes. It's like you can't just like hoard, um, right? Or, you know, make a claim without without giving it value. Mm-hmm. Um, no, you're absolutely right, and also too, you can't you, you can't be um, seemingly hoarding too much uh, too, too many perishables and i use that word advisedly perishables because i don't think that land is necessarily going to be perishable but certainly food will yeah so if you're acquiring too much food that you wouldn't even you know be eating um you know when it goes foul that's sort of i think he even uses like nature sort of binds that right mm-hmm. nature bind, nature creates a limit you know but I do think it, what's interesting, especially with, um, let's say, um, an unfettered capitalism, is there can <laughs> let's put it this way, a uh, uh, someone that believes in unfettered capitalism would certainly say, don't put a limit on what I can acquire. Right. Um, Right. I mean, you're not going to hear that. It's going to like the only limit that should be there is the marketplace. Mm-hmm. Uh, meaning, in other words, like, you know, you, you, you rise or fall dependent, depending on supply and demand. But so that means that you could actually end up being uh, very, very wealthy, um, you know, having like, you know, islands around the world, and a dozen of homes and so on and so forth, which at one level. Right. Someone that has like a billion dollars, like, you know, or is a billionaire, they actually can't really, I mean, work with me. I, I'll probably measure this a little bit, but they can't really use that in a lifetime. Now, I understand that they could build more companies with it. They could do philanthropic work. And then I'd have to pull back on that statement. Right. Mm-hmm. But if, you, if you're just sort of sitting on it, you know, and let's say even sitting on it means you have a bunch of investments and you're getting returns on the investments. Fine, you've invested it, but there's just no way that you're going to be utilizing that much money in a lifetime. It makes me wonder whether or not um, – I wonder what, what Locke would do with that. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, because well, he, I mean he, I wonder he said, what he would do with like supermarkets, right? Like so much food goes yeah, to waste. But sure. the, work and the work was put into it to give it value. So yeah. like that's yeah. different than just nature growing you know, fruits. Correct, correct. Or the, even his example is even acquiring it, right? Just like gathering it together. Uh, it's a type, a type of property making. Uh, Doesn't he do the, that with the acorn uh, example in 28? 28. Acorns, apples. Wait, section 28 or page 28? Section 28. He's um, like, when did, it, when, when did these things, acorns, apples, begin to be his when he digested or when he ate yeah, or when right, he right, boiled right. or when he brought them home or when he picked them up? And tis plain is the first gathering made them not uh, made them not his nothing else could oh that labor put a distinction between them and common that added something to them more than nature um yeah i wonder why he says oh and tis plain if the first gathering made them not his nothing else could okay so it's literally gathering in that context um So I like the notion of I like this notion of labor and investment of time and energy and industry in a thing, in a natural thing, uh, creates a right to private property. My hesitancy is his notion of like being bound, right? Um because he's like he says where are we section 31 page 17 he's like um this you know he's like um 
well, I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase, but can anyone engross, I'll use his word as much as he will. And he's like, not so. The same law of nature that does by this mean give us property, means give us property, does also bound that property too. But is the binding only, that's what I'm saying, with perishable things? You know, mm. is like, like in other words, to take the whole like 1% versus the 99% is, would he comment that, wait a minute, there, there might be some excess here. Um, especially if within the 90, within the 99%, let's say various, um, whatever, you know, the poverty, you know, those that are living in poverty or those that are in the, in the middle class, which is very large, obviously in the United States, but are suffering, right? They're not really able to fully take um advantage of all that the world has to offer because one could argue and some do the one percent is sort of hoarding it right? right not everyone can become the one percent and yeah fine there is movement within the middle class to upper middle class but still there's a massive stagnation you know mm-hmm. um so that's you know that that would be my one hesitancy in 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 in, in uh, well, it's a question. What would he say about that? That's not his world then, right? Um, I mean, he's certainly living during, a, you know, a period of capitalism in England, right? But uh, I don't know that you have these massive extremes at that point. Right. Um, so I like I like this element of getting at what makes property property. I think it's cool. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. It's intuitive. Um, and also, I should say as well, we're talking about a lot of things, but it's not just that, right? Because property um, property is sort of a um, umbrella term, uh, which, which um, includes um, one's own person, right? Yeah. Uh, so that's which obviously you do invest yourself into, um, et cetera. I thought, do you remember his little argument for uh, uh, how he responded to the question, if the earth is held in common, how can there be private property? I, I, I thought that was interesting. Um, I don't recall it specifically. Um, where was the question? That, well, uh, that was, I'm sorry, I'm paraphrasing that. Okay. Um, but let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, by the way, let's see. Hmm. Well, I'll, I'll hold on. Uh, well, let me let me see if I can. I think that's early on. That makes sense that it would be right. Oh, yeah, I think this might be 18. Um, uh, Section 34, page 18. God gave the world to men in common, but since he gave it to them for their benefit and the greatest conveniences of life, they were capable to draw from it. It cannot be supposed he meant it should always remain common and uncultivated. Mm. He gave it to the use of the industrious and rational. Um, So it's sort of like... um, so yeah, like like like, like, like God sort of like creating the opportunity of the commons to become right, or, or, or of, of something that we hold in common to become uh, you know, property through industry, right? Um, which I thought was interesting, right? Hey, if it starts out common, why shouldn't it continue common? Um, if it, you know, what what what's what's that sort of changing you know, or shift because otherwise it seems inconsistent if common should be common but you know common is common until it's not yes exactly <laughs> exactly i mean he goes in 35 tis true in land that is common in england or any other country where there's plenty of people under government who have money and commerce no one can enclose or appropriate any part without the consent of all his all all his fellow commoners because this is left common by compact. So it's sort of like, um, you know, 
let's say sort of like in primordial times when God created, the earth was held in common by every human. Mm-hmm. Um, however, God has also uh, encouraged us to be industrious. We've got the example of Adam and others. Um, and when you do that, that parcel then becomes your property. Uh, however, if there are commons, the uh, th- th- that is ultimately something that needs to be held by the, the, the contract, right? right. So we, if and we you do want that to have too. a common that remains common and is not, yeah. yeah. The mall, the, the mall, work... the mall in Washington D.C. is not owned by anyone. I mean, you could say it's owned by the federal government, right. but it's or not. Like... It's not owned by private by anyone that's private. Yeah, or like the National Wonders, or yes, State exactly. Parks. Exactly. Um, right. National Park. Sure. Yeah. And like work. Well, that was one thing I was going to bring up because it's like it's weird because you might be able to argue that it has value um, before someone put labor into it because it's like a more wonderful site or a more convenient yeah. site of the, you know, that's just positioned yeah. in the world. Um, so it's like, well, OK, clearly this plot of land is way better than that plot of land so it has more value um but they're both common so there's like like there's an interesting playing field there where it's like uh well i guess it's just you know the 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 earth is not fair in the way it's laid out but (laughs) but when it comes to like governments um it, it ends up just it ends up being an agreement that that place will be preserved and there is work yeah. put into it in preserving. That's it. the other thing I was I was going to say. Exactly. I mean, the there, there's there's work put in, into it to preserve it. Yeah. Um, the preserving of it is a kind of industry that there are foresters um, and environmentalists and the, the whole like national park apparatus that protects it. And, and, and what does like um, scheduled burns and things like that, you know, mm-hmm. uh, that is a type of work that, you know, protects it. But in the end, it would be held in common. Yeah. Right. Um, and. Uh, and I think it's important, too, because if you took an unfettered capitalism, then. <laughs> you'd probably see high rises in the middle of the grand Canyon, you know, <laughs> uh, or something like that. You know, right. something absurd. And so it's be- because it's not necessarily unless whatever, unless you had someone come in and was like, you know what, I'm buying this place and I'm holding it, you know, yeah. and I'm going to mm-hmm. charge people to come in, but that's not necessarily the way it would go. Right. Right. Um, Just so depends that, on who gets a hold of it. Yeah that there was insight teddy roosevelt gets a lot of credit for this actually because he was part of the early uh, push to um create national parks um and uh and and and, and nominated a lot of areas as national parks mm-hmm. early in the um 20th century you know so it's um <laughs> yeah government can do good as I would see it, because I quite like. Yeah. You know. One thing I wanted to bring up is um, it's also a restricted common because mm-hmm. it's not like it's a common to someone who's not a part of the government, you know, not mm-hmm. a part of that agreement. You couldn't just have someone from another country just, you know, waltz in, depending on the contract of the government. Um, mm-hmm. So it's common to the people who agree that it's common. Right. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Which, yeah, which, which is, yeah, part of, part of that contract. Yeah. Um, he does speak of money in this section, mm-hmm. which I'm glad he did. Um, I think it's, I think his first mentioning of it is. 37? Oh, no. Wait, yeah. Wait. Actually, um, let's see, what do I have? Maybe it is 37. I hit 36. Yeah, he does mention it in 36. Yeah. Um, actually, if we could go back. Well, we're in 36, so I, I just want to get this section because I had marked it. Um, well, I'll just read it. 36. Nature has has well set the measure of property by the extent of men's labor and the conveniences of life, 
no man's labor could subdue or appropriate all, nor could his enjoyment consume more than a small part, so that it was impossible for any man this way to entrench upon the right of another or acquire to himself a property to the prejudice of his neighbor, who would still have room for as good and as large a possession after the other has taken out his, as before it was appropriated. And it's this part, this measure did confine every man's possession to a very moderate proportion. But then it goes on into the first ages. So it's, I mean, it's, this was the thing I wanted to bring back up about sort of, you know, how much, how much is too much, right? Um, and, and you're right, he does bring up the invention of money in um, 36. But that, you know, I don't know, what do you think about that? Is I mean, do you mean, think there is a type, do you think there is a type of injustice uh, in a few owning a lot or most and the majority owning less and we can add let's say struggling um i mean it depends I mean, you might you might not want to say it's an injustice but yeah know, i don't know well i not mean it's fair it, you know it depends because if um so in this section, it's talking about the measure of property based off of one's labor, right? Yeah. And it can be. And it's sort of it's life. impossible to own everything. I mean, in yeah, some, it is. <laughs> well, know, like that's what he's sort of saying in those early ages. It's impossible to own everything. Right, but has has that changed? I guess is a question. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I mean, one thing to note is like, you know, like I said, the the war the earth is unevenly distributed in you know the value of mm -hmm. the places of it and that's the same right. the same can be said of the people that reside there mm -hmm. um like two people could put in the same amount of labor and have different results just because they are different people um so if that's what this measure is talking about um like what you get out of your labor then if someone who if someone is able to labor enough to acquire like this much greater than someone else in a smaller period of time then like i mean that's just how they are i guess um but this is also a very moderate proportion what do you mean using his language so yeah nature na nature's control on how much you can acquire is a moderate proportion. I mean, I know that's vague, but that certainly isn't an exorbitant proportion. Right. Um, yeah, it gets complicated when you start adding in industrialization and the internet and, and corporations money. and government and yeah, I guess money. Um, I would say money just because all of his examples until he starts discuss discussing money are non-monetary. They might have value, right? But he's not really bringing up the language of this abstract means of exchange that can be acquired, that can be acquired ad infinitum, right? And, and right. seemingly without end. I mean, obviously, there's only much, so much land I can possess. Obviously, there's only so much corn um, I should store, right? Um, you know, and those are, those are types of things where there is a limit, but, uh, you know, with money, you, you, you can, you can dream and, and, and pursue, um, till kingdom come. Right. Um, yeah, there's I mean, definitely I'm sorry, a there, 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 there's a finitude to it. I, I don't want to be stupid, right. but you can acquire and acquire and acquire and acquire and acquire. Um, whereas, Yeah whatever land land and the fruits of land the land and the fruits of you know the land um are more limited seemingly right so i mean difference between perishable things and imperishable things mm -hmm. right like mm -hmm. um yeah acquiring acquiring foods and crops and um cattle and those kinds of things mm -hmm. like in abundance you're gonna have waste so it's gonna be moderated by nature Mm -hmm. um acquiring well, i mean i guess 
acquiring things that don't go to waste. Uh, I'm trying to think, like, I mean, I guess even tools and uh, wood and things like that do go to waste eventually. Um, and then there's money, which is completely abstract and determined yeah. by agreement, right? Like, you have to have mm -hmm. a contract mm -hmm. to have money. Because yeah, before totally. there's money, there was trade, but that, you know, that was convenience based it's like oh well i need to trade a certain i need to, i need to have this and i and i have you know i need apples but i have wood and we can trade those because you need wood um mm -hmm. so the value is determined by the needs of the people but with money uh the value is determined by the trading capabilities mm -hmm. right and the agreement on the value um yeah so assuming that the method of acquiring and, and distrib or trading money is fair, right, mm -hmm. like to one's labor, then you would assume that there wouldn't be an issue with it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, oh, yeah. okay, well, I mean, right. a dollar's worth an apple. Like, an apple's a yeah. dollar. Great. You worked for five apples. You can put that money in apples or you can put it in wood. Like, you know, equal, equal trade. But... Mm -hmm it gets really hairy because it's hard to measure the value of an arbitrary unit and how to convert it into things that, that aren't. Yeah. Um, especially when it comes to like uh, paying someone to do labor for you, right? Mm -hmm. And like when you bring capitalism into it, um, you know, there's going to be competing opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, so the value actually changes depending on who you work for. So it's it's way more dynamic, and there's way more opportunities to, uh, I don't want to say cheat the system, but like yeah. you know take advantage of it. Um, Hedge funds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the opposite. Well, it depends on the situation. <laughs> well, gaming, gaming, gaming the system. Yeah, gaming the system. Yeah, um, that's where I was going. Yeah. Um, so it's a lot harder to to measure. Mm -hmm. um, also because like when when you have people who have different amounts of wealth it's like right. the value to them is not proportional yeah right like a dollar is not a dollar for one person as it is to another person it means totally different thing um, so even in right. that sense like value is not determined like value isn't just determined by the the monetary unit. It's determined by the context of like of who has it. Like if a billionaire has a dollar, he doesn't care if he loses it. But if right. you know someone in poverty loses a dollar, that could that could yeah. mean something. No, it's true. He it's funny, there there are throughout the, the property section language about um sort of too much, but they're but it but it's never really related to money. You know, I mean, even at the end um, of the section, section 51, um, he's like, what portion a man carved to himself was easily seen and it was useless as well as dishonest to carve himself too much or to take more than he needed. But more than he needed is interesting, you know, because I, I think he's got this notion of, you know, it, it, there might be an element of... <clears throat> uh, uh, what's the word difference let's say between how much property one has has acquired right uh because of industry and if you're going to be industrious you may very well have more if you're not going to be industrious you may very well has have less uh but but it does seem like there are like like there are these sort of hints that um it's sort of like everything in moderation when it, when it comes to um, acquiring things, mm -hmm. right? And, but, but, so it's, it's just, I'm trying to bring Locke into, you know, 2021 and sort of like look at, look at the economic world through Lockean eyes and, and what type of conclusions would he draw, right? Um, on everything we've been talking about. So, and that's, that, that's the part that's sort of tricky, you know? Um, it's sort of, um, my sense is that it's like, you know what, 
if I if if I'm able to get my farm and I'm able to work my farm, or if I let's do it this way, I'm able to, uh, you know, um, head out west, right, eighteen hundreds, and I'm able to find land that's not populated, and I populate it with my family, and we work it and we toil it. This becomes ours, right? It was it was held in common. It was just the commons before. But because I have sort of marked it off and put my work into it, um, this is my private property. I, I feel like it's more that vision than it is the uh, the, the the billionaire vision. Mm-hmm. Do you know, it's more the vision of like what you need to sustain life. And if you got a little extra, fine, but <laughs> but not an extreme amount. Now, I'd have to see how that would play out with the rest of what he says, right? Meaning, in other words, how does how, how would an exorbitant amount of wealth and property play into the rest of his notion about civil society? Like, in other words, would, would it actually hurt others in yeah. their pursuit of life, liberty, and property, right? Yeah. Um, and if it did, then we could comment then we could then we could comment on that you know however if i'm wrong and you take sort of this trickle down economics not very popular among some that well you know what you know uh jeff bezos is actually creating work for others and yes he's got a crazy amount of money but you know um he, he's able to create work and therefore those employees are able to benefit from it yeah how is it hurting how is it hurting right right um so, but but that's going to bring us up, and I and we're totally going to hit this when we hit the identity uh, politics part of our discussions about opportunity. You know, just it, it's it's not. I think anyone that says that it's sort of like everyone is, everyone has a uh, an, a a similar starting point in the economic race um, is naive. Mm-hmm. You know. Because you just, I mean, there, there's there's so much up against, there's so much for certain, uh, let's say, children that are born, and so much against others, other children that are born into whatever situation they're born, economically, psychologically, familially, um, education-wise, you know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that will become, an, you know, sort of an important piece to consider. In Definitely. Life. Um, just sort of in conclusion, the last few pieces were interesting. Um, <laughs> I like the whole like criticism of paternal power mm-hmm. that it's sort of like, hey, you who thought uh, who, you who were sort of using this, you know, divine right theory based on Adam and based on sort of, you know, the father, the, the pater familias holding the power over the family, you're sort of missing a component. What about the mother? Right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's sort of like she's just as much involved uh she you know in, in terms of like whatever creating the child and is a parent you know yeah i thought that was sort of interesting which probably at the time was uh somewhat progressive you know um you know to to to, to include her in the power structure right because i think yeah. one of his criticisms in this is oh you point to the father sort of historically and then you move from the father to the prince you know wait a minute it's not just sort of the father but it's sort of the father and mother combined you know mm-hmm. um so i thought that that was that was interesting is this also the whole bit on the child is that right i think so, so yeah the, the role of the child that basically the chi- oh yeah that is it that the child is um uh, sort of an, ex- an exception yes. uh, because they're not born in or they're born into it. Therefore they're under the care of the parents, um, you know, until they come to this sort of age of reason to be able to, to understand as the world. Were. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the interesting, I'm not sure if it was in this section as well, but I, another interesting part. Um, and I think we've raised this before um, in other talks, is why is it the case that I have to, just because I'm born into the society, abide by their laws? I was born into it. I didn't make the laws, so on and so forth. And, I, and he, at one point, he says, and it, I might be jumping ahead, but um, that as soon as you start to enjoy it, 
that's when you are tacitly, that's a tacit consent. That's when you were tacitly consenting to it. Um, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Where are you seeing this? Okay. This is, um, this is, hmm. oh yeah, this would be around 111 okay. or thereafter. No, 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 hold on. But it's maybe thereafter. I don't know why I didn't note this. Oh, yeah, the, uh, sorry, 119, page 61. Um, so uh -huh. it, 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 it's continuing this notion that the child is born of no country or government. He's under the father's tuition and authority. And then transitions up to 119. Um, every man naturally free. Uh, only really comes into the civil society by his own consent. And that has to be, um, uh, oh, the distinction between express and tacit or explicit and implicit, right? So the explicit one's obvious, whatever, like when dad came over to the United States, um, you know, to become a citizen, he is obviously explicitly stating his devotion to the country, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but they, But there's tacit consent as well. That is to say, like, you're not saying it in so many words, but you're performing other actions that show that you are actually accepting the contract. Right. Um, so I, I think the, the part that I'm looking at in particular is um, on 119, it says... Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. And to this I say that every man that hath any possessions or enjoyment of any part of the dominions of any government doth thereby give his tacit consent and is as far forth obliged to obedience to the laws of that government during such enjoyment as any one under it, hmm. whether his position be of land to him and his heirs forever or lodging only for a week. I like that one. Or whether it be barely traveling freely on the highway. And in effect, it reaches as far as the very being of any one within the territories of that government. So it's sort of like you can also, there, there are ways to show your tacit uh, or implicit, silent, as it were, uh, consent. I think at the bottom of this page, he even goes on inheritance, purchase, permission, or other ways enjoys any part of the land. Um, so hmm. this this sort of because um, I mean it, it needs to be addressed, right? Yeah. Like, why should I hold to this if I haven't? You know. So it's sort of it's like it's like, um, hey, buddy, your, your piece is on the board. You're playing the game. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, like you can't, you can't sort of get out of it. You can't say, I, you know, um, can't go to the other can't board. Can't go to the other board, right? Uh, seemingly. So, no, I, I quite like this. I, I do think or that what we've read, I do think um, the uh, the language toward as we get toward the end of our reading about le the, the distinction between legislative and executive, and also his focus on majority rule even though he doesn't really seem to, in this section, endorse a commonwealth, right? Um, it seems like he's certainly leaning toward one. Yeah. Right? Um, which... Uh, well, and, like, the fact, like, the commonwealth that he talks about, I think it was, what, the Civitas? Yeah. Um, is very dynamic in how it's structured. Mm. Like, the people can change the form of government to what is for the good of the politics, or, yep. right? Yep. Yeah. Which is very different. Uh, which seems different from like Hobbes's, you know, absolute, uh, absolute power of the sovereign, because in that case, it's like the sovereign decides what changes. Yeah. Totally. And if the sovereign is built by people, then it makes sense that the people yeah. could change it. But if it's not, then that doesn't work. Whereas in yeah, this, that... it's like if the people yeah. decide to overthrow a monarchical ruler 
because it's for the good of people, then so be it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was noticing throughout that the language about sort of the contract and what, what the individual is, is, how you're shifting your power to the other, Hobbes was always the sovereign, right? But the yeah. language that, you know, the language that um, Locke has used in this section or in, in what we've read, is, I mean, he uses society at some time, at like some points. Yep. Um, it's, and then also the, you know, he's very much against, and what section was this? Um, it's funny, I took a lot of notes on this section, but we didn't discuss it, was... Um, Oh, yeah. The um God, where was that? Um Well, I'll just paraphrase them. I, I can't point to it right now. But that the um that, that basically no one is is um that everyone is under the law. Mm -hmm. We talked about this before with Hobbes that with the, the sovereigns is not the sovereign is above, so if, or if you will, the sovereign is the law. How can you be, you know, how uh, how how can it sort of submit to it? It is it, or it it creates it. Um, and not so with Locke. I mean, like everyone is part of this agreement. And it, what what's interesting is, um, as uh, per our last conversation, you know are we going to find more and more that really the buck stops at the law, right? Or the constitution or the, the, the contract mm -hmm. as opposed to the individual, you know? Um, so that is another, another key distinction uh, between these two thinkers. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. All right. All righty.